Well, good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Good, good. You know, I just uh, love being a part of churches that are actively involved in their community, actively involved in, in making a difference. And, man, it's just amazing how stuff like uh, One for One makes a practical difference in that way. Uh, so, again, don't forget, $1. Every single week, we all bring one extra dollar, and we drop it off in that bank back there. So make sure you do that. And stuff like Kids Camp, guys. Like, Kids Camp is such a big deal for uh, our church, not just because we have some cool stuff for our kids to go to and, and uh, to participate in and to learn about Jesus in that way, um, but it's an outreach into our community that's, that's, that's pretty great um, because we are involved with Friendship Place and their camp, their, uh, their Olympic camp that they put on. Uh, we were able to talk to them about kids camp, so we have kids coming from there that normally wouldn't be here, which means we got kids who are going to hear about Jesus in a new way because of that. And and uh, we see we see growth um, in our church uh, because of stuff like kids camp because people come in from the community, the kids want to come back, and it's interesting how sometimes people are willing to do for their kids what they're not willing to do for themselves. You ever noticed that before? And so, so stuff like Kids Camp is actually not just, just for a great thing for our kids, but it's an outreach into the community. And so when you get involved and uh, volunteer in that way, it makes a big difference, uh, more than you realize. Okay, we have people come to our church because their kids first showed up at these kinds of events, and now they're coming. So volunteer for that. It's going to be great. Well, I haven't um, had nerd talk with you guys in a while. Um, just for some, if, if you're new with us today, I'm, I'm kind of a huge nerd, literally and figuratively, and, uh, and, I, and I really enjoy that stuff, and so uh, I, I probably could talk about this nerd stuff a lot more, so if you're kind of like, oh man, here comes another one of these references, just for the record, it could be worse, and it's for you that I don't do it. Okay, so um, I, I'm loving how uh, these characters, these from comic books, that I loved when I was a kid and, and as a teenager, young adult, as, you know, I, that these guys are starting to, to take over the big screen. I just love it. Um, they're, the, these guys have been in movies for a while, but they weren't always that good. And now they're good. You know, so it's really nice that, that uh, we have some, some good superhero movies that are coming out. But it's not just uh, these guys like Spider-Man and the X-Men. You know, man, those were some of my favorites when I was growing up as a kid. Uh, but there's some great TV shows out there now that are, that are portraying these guys in a good light. One of which that I'm really thrilled about that's doing well is actually Daredevil. Um, I got into Daredevil uh, a little bit later on in life when I started reading some of his comic books. So he's just a really interesting character. And so I'm, I'm grateful that the show on Netflix is doing very well for itself because finally, you know, the movie that they had didn't get a lot of great reviews. I don't know what everyone's problem was with that movie. It was fine. People are just critical for the fun of it sometimes, I think. But anyways, um, so, so it's a really violent show. I can't, like, tell you, like, I can't give you my recommendation to watch it because there's cursing and violence. There's, there's, luckily, there's no nudity. There's a little bit of sexuality in there. But, but the show has done very well for itself. And I, and I like that because Daredevil's a really interesting character uh, because, like, he's, you know, he's a superhero. He does all the superhero stuff. But at the same time, he's also, uh, he's also a lawyer. Uh, that's his, you know, that's his, like, disguise, right? Matt Murdock, he's the lawyer guy. And he's got this strong sense of justice, which obviously most superheroes do. Uh, but he's one of those superheroes that believes that it's not his job to be the judge. It's his job to bring in the bad guy so that they can be judged. So he refuses to kill. He's kind of like Batman in that way, except I think Daredevil's a little bit more relatable because he's not dealing with psychopaths like the Joker and that kind of stuff, right? Daredevil's a little bit more down-to-earth criminals, you know, a little bit easier to deal with. Anyways, um, so What's interesting, though, is that the second season of Daredevil um, got even uh, more attention because they brought in another character called the Punisher. And the Punisher did very, very well. In fact, there's some serious talk right now about the Punisher having his own series because everyone loved this character. And I find the Punisher intriguing uh, just because he's just like any other, he's kind of an anti-hero because he cares about justice, but he's not afraid to also be the judge. In that case, okay, he's not afraid to to be the one that is is the judge and the jury and the executor of bad guys. Now, now what I what I like about comic books and comic book characters is that they deal with some pretty uh, real issues in life. Now, I know some of you are rolling your eyes right now, just talking, just hearing me talk about this, okay? But uh, when when the AIDS uh, crisis happened. 
Okay, they were talking about it in X Men. When when uh, when homosexuality really started to come up, they started dealing with these issues. When 9/11 happened, there's some really intense uh, comic books out there with these superheroes. When 9/11 happened, they they are not afraid to go after some of these uh, really really difficult issues. And one of the issues again that I think is very interesting that Daredevil and Punisher deal with is this idea: is if you have this power, if you have the power to really stop evil, how far are you willing to take it? Okay, I like that, because you and I are never going to deal with that, right? You and I probably are never going to deal with the point where it's like, well, should, should I stop this person from ever doing bad again, or how do we take care of this? But, but what I've noticed, the reason why I bring all this up, okay, the reason why I bring all this up, okay, is that the Punisher did very, very well for itself. And I don't know about you, but I have noticed in our culture today, there are a lot of movies and TV shows and media and books and all this stuff that's, that's surrounding this idea of revenge, have you noticed that? Has anyone else noticed that in our culture today? Maybe it's always been that way, and I'm just starting to notice it, but it seems like lately there are a lot of movies and TV shows like The Punisher that are, that are focused on this idea of, of justice and re- getting revenge. Okay, like, you know, that show, Liam Neeson, like, I don't, I don't know who you are, but I'm going to get you. You know, when he's on the phone with that guy and he's going to get his daughter. I mean, how many times does his daughter get kidnapped? Doesn't he have, like, three movies now? You think you'd take better care of her or whatever. But anyways, um, there's, all these, there's all these movies focused around this revenge. And, and, and I don't think you, it doesn't take much to have to read between the lines. But you look out on our news today, and I think people feel pretty powerless. And, and, and there's a desire for justice in our world today that is very, very strong. I think that's why we're having these marches all over the place, Right? Because people want justice, and, and they look at their authorities, the authority system that's in place, whether it's our government, whether it's our police, or whatever. They're looking at the, at the authority in our lives, and they're saying they are not judging correctly. They are not giving justice the way that I think justice should play out. And I know most of you are probably thinking, well, he's referencing like the Black Lives Matters movement and all that kind of stuff. No, guys, I'm actually talking about some of you. Because, again, I'm on your Facebook pages. And you guys, some of you are not very happy with how our judges and juries and all that. You desire justice, and you don't think that that judgment is happening the way that it should. See, I've noticed, guys, I don't know if you notice it, but in my own heart, I've noticed that I really desire justice. Has anyone else ever got stuck watching those uh, instant instant justice or instant karma videos on YouTube or Facebook. Anyone else ever been there? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Those instant karma videos where someone does something bad and then in the video you immediately see that they get what's coming to them. I've never not seen anyone watch those videos and be like, oh, that was so sad. They're like, ha, 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 gotcha. Because inside of us, there is a desire for justice. Now, I think that it's God sent. Okay, God made you in his image. And our God is a judge, Right? Our God is a judge. Our God is a God of justice. Okay, so I think it's inside of us to desire justice. I think it's, I think it's inside of us to cast judgment, to make judgment, because he is that God. But then we come across a, a verse in the Bible that says, Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, mercy triumphs over judgment. And today we're going to look at this idea that we all want justice and we all judge We all do it, right? We all judge and we all desire justice, but mercy triumphs over that. Now, that doesn't mean that mercy trumps judgment. It doesn't mean that mercy trumps justice. In fact, we're going to find out that you can't have true mercy without justice. You can't have true mercy without judgment. But we're going to see how that all kind of relates to one another um, as we dig into God's word. Um, But before we dig into it, I just want to, some of you were here a couple weeks back when we talked about forgiveness. And I know some of you were really impacted by that one because you told me. Um, I had a lot of letters and, and I had a lot of people pulling me aside and Facebook messages and stuff like that where that really hits you personally. I just want you to know, like, this really is a reinforcement of what we talked about a couple weeks back. And if you weren't uh, with us a couple weeks back, maybe you're new with us today or maybe you're on vacation, whatever, I would encourage you to go back to a couple weeks back and listen to that because it'll help. Those, these two messages really fit into context with one another really nicely. But we're, again, before we dig into God's word, we always pray. And I always have this little disclaimer, like, why are you guys here today? You know, like, what, are, you, are you here because you're, like, wanting to just be at church and because that's what Christians do, we go to church? 
Or is there a chance that maybe God wants you to find freedom in something today? It's up to you and your heart whether or not that's going to happen, okay? So let's pray, soften our hearts, and get ready for the word, okay? Father, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for your word, and I thank you for uh, your justice in this world today. God, I know sometimes it's hard to see where you're at and all that, but I thank you for how you have shown it to us. Father, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to see it. But God, I pray that you would help us to see where our role is in, is, is in all of this. So, so God, would you uh, prepare our hearts in a way that only you can? Would your spirit run free in this room? Would the enemy have no place in our ears? And I pray you take anything away from me you don't want me to say and put in the things that I might be missing, God, so that you would be glorified in this place and in our lives, in our city, in our country, God, in this world, because we live the way you've called us to live. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke 9. So go ahead and start flipping on over to Luke 9. We're going to be starting in verse 51. Just as a reminder, Jesus has been in, his, in a couple of years of ministry already. He's been raising the dead. He's been healing people of diseases. He's been casting out demons. He's, he's been having this pretty radical teaching uh, where he's not breaking the law of Moses in any way, but he is breaking the oral traditions that the Pharisees have kind of built around the law, you know, and all these extra oral laws that they had put um, um, all around the, 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 the law of Moses. And so, and so uh, the, the people are loving it. Uh, they're loving Jesus because he's just bringing in so much freedom in his teaching and it makes so much sense. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and the rulers, the religious rulers of the day, they can't stand Jesus. In fact, um, they, they got his number, man. They're looking out for him. They're ready for him to die, okay? And uh, they, want, they want to either put him in jail, discredit him as a teacher, or kill him off. There have been plans to kill him off. And, and Jesus has said to his disciples that he is going to be murdered in Jerusalem. He said it flat out, and we're going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to die. Now, he told him he's going to raise up three, three days later, but if you're one of the disciples, I don't think you're get, really getting past, like, hey, I'm going to die. I'm going to be killed. Okay, so he's already talked about this. Now, at the same time, Jesus is got his uh, really amazing reputation because, I mean, if you're raising people from the dead and you're, you know, you're doing all this great teaching and, and doing all these miracles and stuff, yeah, you have a pretty great reputation, but the disciples, the disciples are, are, are convinced that this is the Messiah. This is the King of kings, the, the Lord of lords, the Son of God that we have been waiting for. Okay? That's really important to keep in mind as we look at this story. That's actually... It's a story that'd be really easy for us to just kind of pass over, but there's there's a lot of depth in this when you understand uh, contextually what's going on in their lives and where they're headed. Okay, they're they're on their way to go to the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. Now, Luke nine fifty one says, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out to Jerusalem. Now you'll notice a shift in Luke's writing here. Before it was all about the coming of the Messiah and the coming of this God, the coming of Jesus. And, and from this point forward, it's going to be all about the going of Jesus to the cross. So there's kind of like this shift in the way that Luke writes here. And 52, it says, And he sent messengers on ahead who went to some, the Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? Now, Again, this would just be really easy to pass over me like, well, gung-ho guys. But let's think about really what's going on here. This, this, is, this, is, James and, uh, this is James and John, and they kind of have a reputation. Jesus called them the sons of thunder, if that, makes, you know, if that gives you an idea. Uh, they, 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 are, they, they are with their rabbi, with their Lord, with their Savior, their Messiah, their King. And these Samaritans are not uh, letting them stay or get food or, or you know, get what they need at this village. And so they're all, they're all hyped up about this. They say, Jesus... You just say the word, we'll call down fire from heaven. And again, remember, these, these guys grew up in a Jewish culture where they're taught about the stories of, of Elijah and, 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 uh, and, and Moses and fire raining down on the Egyptians, you know, and fire coming down on Sodom and Gomorrah and, and, uh, and, and fire coming down from heaven from Elijah. You know, so they grew up with these stories and they're convinced that Jesus is this Messiah, is this King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and these Samaritans. And you got to keep in mind that Jews didn't like the Samaritans. They're kind of like this half breed. Okay, they they hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans hated it. So these these filthy Gentile Samaritans just 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 uh, just you know they 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 insulted our our Messiah, our King. So let's let's destroy him now. Okay, you got to stop and think about it. like this is this seems pretty out of character even for the disciples, don't you think? 
look ahead and look after this. There's not a lot of this kind of talk from the disciples. So what's going on? Why such a strong, like, Jesus, let's kill this whole village. Man, woman, children, let's kill them all. Fire from heaven. What do you say? Okay, let's get into their heads again. Okay? They believe this is their king. That's a big deal. Okay? But they also heard Jesus, who tends to be right. Okay? Jesus tends to know what he's talking about. And, and Jesus just told them that if, if he goes to Jerusalem, he's going to be killed. Okay? And, and this will not be the first time that the disciples try to stop that from happening. So get into the disciples' heads. Maybe even at a subconscious level, these guys are thinking, so we're heading to Jerusalem. Jesus himself told us that when we go there, he's probably going to die. We don't want that to happen. So let's just call down judgment on this Samaritan village. Word would travel fairly quickly. And when we get to Jerusalem, people probably won't be willing to mess with us. In fact, we might even convert some, some of these people. Because if they hear about this lowly Samaritan village being completely destroyed, then maybe, just maybe, just maybe, our Savior won't have to die. Does that, doesn't that make sense? Doesn't that make Because, again, we don't see this in the disciples any other place except for this moment. It's because they're afraid, guys. They're afraid. But they also want justice. And so because they want justice... They deemed judgment on this place. Okay? Now look at Jesus' response to their request. Jesus turned and rebuked them. You fools. Guys, you don't know what you're talking about. And then he and his disciples went to another village. You see, Jesus had this amazing ability to kind of know what was going on. And, and, and as he looked at, this, looked at this Samaritan village, he knew that Philip... Okay, that, that very soon, he was going to go and die on the cross, raise back up to life. He was going to send into heaven, and then, and then the Holy Spirit was going to come on his church, and they were going to start spreading the message of his love for mankind through the death of his cross to the rest of the world. And he knew that his disciple, Philip, was going to be traveling through this very area, proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins. And he didn't, and it's really hard to make converts out of piles of ash, right? It's kind of hard to make converts out of piles of ash. You see, Jesus loved these people. Jesus loved these people. He had a different perspective on, on, on this village than the disciples could see. They wanted justice, and because they wanted justice, they, they, they cast judgment on this place. But notice the mercy of Jesus. We all have this. We all have this inside of us, okay? Um, I was... We have many nurses uh, who come to our church who are part of, of, uh, of Mayo. And uh, uh, one of the husbands of one of our nurses was telling me a story about how uh, recently uh, this gal was taking care of this guy and, and he was kind of on some stuff or whatever. But uh, just out of nowhere, while she was taking care of him, he just pulled back and, uh, and knocked her and, and punched her in the face and knocked her on the floor. And he's telling me this story. And inside of my heart... Inside of my heart, they're flamed up, they're, they're, they're powered up this fire. And I'm just, and, and my response, even though I'm all bark and no bite, my response was like, well, you just tell me what room. Just tell me what room, man. Because <laughs> I, I go to the hospital all the time. No one would suspect the big fluffy pastor being the one and taking care of this, right? Like, I just kind of go in and out, no problem, right? I'm glad some of you laughed at my demented humor. I thought it was funny. Anyways. Um, so, 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 I mean, I hear that story, right? And my blood starts to boil. I care about this person. I desire justice for what happened to this woman that I care about, and therefore I cast judgment. And my judgment is not fair. My judgment is not right, because what does this guy need? What does this guy need? Obviously, he's on stuff. Obviously, he's going through things. This guy doesn't need just more of this. He's going to get more justice. He's faced more judgment and injustice in his life. It's probably one of the reasons why he is where he is today. What he needs is the love of Christ in his life, right? What he needs to know is that despite of all the things that he's done, there is a God who created him and loved him. That's what he needs, right? But see, we in our hearts, guys, in our hearts, we desire justice. And therefore, we judge now, what's cool is that Jesus, he goes to, onto the Feast of Tabernacles, right? He goes onto the Feast of Tabernacles, and there he shows his disciples a pretty amazing demonstration of the kind of mercy that he's talking about here. So you can flip on over, uh, flip on over to John 8, 
Okay. Now, as we're flipping over there, I got a little, got to talk a little bit about this passage. If you are, if you have an NIV Bible, you might notice that there's some that this story is in brackets, or you might see an asterisk or a special side note about this particular section of Scripture. That is because what we're about to read was actually not found in some of the earliest manuscripts of the of the Bible that we have. Okay, this is something that came in later. Now, um, now because it's still there's a couple reasons why. It's not why, why it's got brackets around it, these side notes. is because Jesus does a couple things. Like he's, he's, you're going to see he stoops down and starts writing the ground. He doesn't really ever do anything like that. Uh, they also call Jesus to be a judge, which, again, they never really did that before. And so there's a couple things about the story that are off. But there's also, especially Jesus' response here, is very like classic Jesus. And, and in fact, as we continue to study, we found that uh, Papias, uh, Papias was the disciple of John, who was the disciple of Jesus. Okay? Uh, Papias was familiar with the story. He knew this story, okay? Uh, and uh, and St. Augustine, he talked about how, how um, it, in, in the early days, they probably omitted this from, from, the, from the, when they were recording it because they didn't want would-be adulterers to look at this verse and use it as, as an excuse to, to continue on with their adultery, okay? Now, the reason why it was included later is because while they were copying out um, you know, these letters by these guys and when it became canonized scripture, as they were copying it out, at the same time, the stories about Christ were, were continuing on in a thing called oral tradition. Now, oral tradition is, is, uh, is, is an old way of, of passing on history before there was writing and, and what we have. You know, we can, we can pass on information and write it down and record it. In, in the old day, they would, have, they would tell these stories over and over and over and, and the whole community was in charge of making sure that there were no discrepancies in these stories. And they have found that oral tradition is very, uh, is, is, uh, very accurate. Okay? And so, so while these were still being recorded, oral tradition of Jesus and, and his disciples and these stories were being passed along as well. And so later on, it looks like a scribe decided to take this story that was in oral tradition of Jesus and stick it back in. Now, I'm just putting that all out there because sometimes I know that when you're reading your Bible, you see that kind of stuff. It can cause these alarms to go off inside. It's like, well, man, if... if if this isn't real, then how can we know that the rest of it is real? Okay, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on all this stuff. Again, the disciple of one of Jesus' disciples was familiar with this story, okay? And, and oral tradition it was, was alive and well back in the day and very reliable, something you depend on. So we are going to teach this verse. We're just going to kind of hold it lightly in our hands. And again, you're going to see why I was willing to even preach on this here in just a second. So we're going to look at John 8, verse 2. At dawn, he appeared again at the temple courts where all the people were gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them like he always did. Verse 3, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in, a, in adultery, and they made her stand before the group. And they said to Jesus, teacher, this woman is caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? Now verse 6 says they were using this question as a trap in order for a basis of accusing him. See, they, what they thought they brought before Jesus was like a lose-lose situation. If he condemned this woman because of the law of Moses, then Jesus would be guilty for condoning, um, for, for condoning capital punishment, which was not allowed by anyone except for Rome. Only Rome was allowed to judge and kill people for their crimes. So if Jesus allowed this to happen, then the, then the Pharisees could point at Jesus and be like, well, he's the one who said to do it, and the Romans, would come, the, the Romans would come in and take him and put him in prison. Okay, But if he doesn't say that, that, he should, that they should stone him, then they can accuse him of not following the law, and they can discredit him as a rabbi. So in their minds, this is like this lose-lose situation. It says, but we'll continue on. Verse 6. But Jesus bent down, started right on the ground with his finger. When they kept questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Let any of you who are without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. Now, we in our westernized American understanding of Scripture look at this verse and we grab a hold of this and we say, Yes! See, that's why you can't judge me. Because until you are without sin, you can't cast any stones at me. You can't tell me how to live. You can't, you can't tell me what to do because you yourself are perfect. Therefore, we have no right to judge one another. Okay. Oh, man, what a great verse to rip out of context. right? And use it for our own, for our own desires. But see, that's not what Jesus is saying. Um, in, in the law, in, in uh, Deuteronomy 19 and Exodus 23, it says very specifically that a witness to something like this 
has to be without any uh, deceit or any malice. Okay, any deceit and no malice. And and in the in the law and in the Jewish tradition, the oral tradition. The person that would cast the first stone had to be a witness with no malice or deceit in their heart. And this was an obvious trap. And so Jesus calls them out on the fact that they are the ones that are breaking Moses' law. They are the ones that are in the wrong here. And he says, okay, those of you who are without sin, those of you who are a witness with no malice or deceit in your heart, you cast the first stone. You cast the first stone, and look what happens. Look what happens. At this, those who heard began to go away, one at a time, the older first, until only Jesus was left, and the woman was standing there. Boom! This is why I'm willing to teach this verse, because classic Jesus, they bring in these traps, and in one statement or one question, he completely disrupts their arguments. Okay? That is our Jesus. He does it all the time. And again, so if you don't like this verse and you want to pull it out of your Bible, that's fine. There's lots and lots of scriptures of Jesus giving people mercy. That's fine. Okay, that's fine. The reason I'm talking about it is because the disciples were wanted to judge. Jesus showed mercy, and then he shows them a great example of it later on. Just like, like a couple days later, he shows this to them, okay? So continuing on, listen to what he says. He says, um, Oh, sorry, I lost my place there. Jesus straightened, and he asked the woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, Jesus said, then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go on, go now, and leave your life of sin. Go now and leave, there it is, mercy triumphing over judgment. Now, some of you in this room are thinkers. And some of you in this room, I know, and some of you, maybe if you're watching with us online later, some of you will look at this and you see Jesus in this moment as a strict contradiction of the God of the Old Testament. How in the world can Jesus Christ be the incarnate God of the Old Testament? Because the God of the Old Testament was the one who wrote down the law. That if a woman were to commit adultery, that she could be stoned for it. That the God of the Old Testament was the one that brought fire down from heaven to kill off these heathens, these people who who wouldn't obey him and wouldn't do what he wanted to. How can Jesus and the God of the Old Testament make any sense together? Aren't they just a contradiction? Isn't this idea of mercy triumphing over judgment, isn't that a contradiction to the God that we see in the Bible? And you just got to say, guys, this, that is not our God. Okay? This, this God, he does, not, he does not contradict himself in this. Yes, God was very clear in his word, in, in his law, about what was right and was wrong and how he wanted people to be punished in the midst of it. Yes, God was the one that called down fire from heaven and destroyed entire villages, men, women, and children. He was that God. Okay, but that God also set up this specific law for one purpose. Paul talks about it. I'm not going to get into it because I'm running out of time here. Paul talks about this specifically, that he gave us a law that we might know and understand our sin and how, and how, and how helpless we are against the sin in our life. He, point, he gave us the law so that we would recognize our sin, so that we would recognize our need of a Savior. That there's no deed, there's no uh, amount of good that I can do that are gonna, that's going to pile up against the bad that I do. So he set in a system in place that was temporary until his son could come in and be the ultimate sacrificial lamb, the ultimate sacrifice of all these laws about you know, killing one, all this stuff. Like, that those, were, those, were, those, were, those, were, those were a setup so that Jesus would just make sense. All these laws that I'm never going to be able to fulfill and then Jesus shows up. And he, and he fulfills every single one of them, dies on the cross, okay? And, and, and because he set up the law, then he too can also offer us mercy. You see, mercy doesn't contradict justice. Mercy doesn't nullify judgment. Neither does justice nullify mercy. In the kingdom of God, they're hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Okay? And, and there's a great verse that shows us that in James... Okay, James uh, 2, starting in verse 12. Listen to this. Speak and act. Okay? I'm going to stop right there. Those are action words. We're going to get back to those. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Because mercy triumphs over judgment. There it is. 
There it is, loud and clear, because mercy triumphs over judgment. Notice how, G, how James is referring to the law. Jesus, uh, sorry, James, the brother of Jesus, that's why I keep putting those two words together. Also, I was up till 2 o'clock last night because of that storm. Anyone else awake because of that storm? Man, I got no sleep because of that thing. Anyways, so James talks about a law here. And in the law, it talks about judgment. And in the law, it talks about how there will be those who are going to be condemned. But we are under a law that gives us grace. You see, God is a God of justice. But what's interesting about the God that we follow is that justice was played out in a way that no one could anticipate. You see, the rest of our world today, even all the major religions of our world today, they look at God and they want a God of justice. They do. They want a God of justice. But the thing is, is that they, they forget who pays for, that, for those crimes. See, they believe that it's going to be us paying for the good or the bad that we've done. But the gospel of Jesus Christ comes along. It shows us that justice was paid out, was, was, was doled out. Judgment was doled out, but it was given to someone that we would have never anticipated. The one who didn't deserve this justice the most took it. The one who didn't deserve any judgment because he didn't sin, Jesus Christ. He never sinned while he was on this earth. He never walked out of his father's will. And because of that, he didn't deserve to die, but he took my justice on him. Okay, so, so the God of the Old Testament set up all these laws so we would recognize how badly, how, that God is a God of judgment, that God is a God of justice, and how badly there's no way we're ever going to be able to do all this stuff perfectly. And then Jesus comes along and does it perfectly. And then he goes up on the cross and he dies anyways. He did it all perfect, because, therefore he didn't deserve to die. The wages of sin is death. That's what Paul tells us. The wages of sin is death. That means if you sin, you die. Jesus didn't sin, therefore he didn't die. But justice, my justice, the, the judgment that I deserve, the justice that I deserve, went up on the cross when Jesus was there. Okay, And because of that justice, I received mercy. You get that? So mercy doesn't trump judgment, but mercy for you triumphs over the judgment of God because his son went to the cross and took that justice, took that judgment for you. And then he calls us out. He says, because you now live under this new law, this new law, this old law, this old law, we don't follow this. We are under a new covenant because we are under this, this new law of mercy and grace where your sin is not counted against you anymore because your sin, uh, the punishment and the judgment for your sin has already been taken on the cross. Now that you live in this new covenant, this new law, then you speak and you act as people living under this new covenant, which means if you do not have judgment and justice being held against you, then you have no right to hold it against anyone else. You have no right holding it against anyone else. I'm going to say it again. You have no right holding it against somebody else. I need you right now to take that one person in your life that causes your stomach to turn. I need you to take that one person in your life that has hurt you. That one person in your life that you so desire to see them face justice for the things that they've done, for the things that they've said, for the, how they have hurt you, for how they have excluded you, for the things that they have done to you, the things that you know you know that if you stay in relationship with them, they're going to continue to do that. I want you to think about that person right now. I want you to picture them. Close your eyes if you need to, if that helps you. I want you to think about that person right now. And then what I want you to do is I want you to think about them under this new law. And I want you to ask yourself, are you holding justice and judgment against this person still? And how does that affect the way you live around them? How does that affect the way you talk around them? Speak and act, James says, as people living under this new law, as people living under this law that leads to mercy, not judgment. And I want you to remember that this person, regardless of what they have done to you, that their sin, just like yours, 
has already been paid for on a cross. Maybe they haven't accepted it yet. That's the difference between a couple weeks back and, and this week. You know, last, in a couple weeks back, we talked about people who have themselves already accepted the cross of Christ. It's ridiculous for you to hold anything against them because they have already accepted justice and therefore received mercy, right? But maybe this person in your life hasn't yet accepted that. I want you to ask yourself, how do you think Jesus sees them? Not the way you see them, not the way your Americanized, culturally understanding view, perspective of these person, not how you see them. I want you to ask yourself, from the, in view of the cross, how do you think God sees that person? Do you think God wants that person to be with him, to make it into heaven, to have a saving relationship with him? If you say anything less than no, then you do not know this God. You do not know this Savior, Jesus Christ. And because that is the truth about this person that you are holding this stuff against, that you want to see justice, you want to see judgment, because, because you are holding that against them, okay? You are not acting and speaking like someone who lives under this law. You're acting and speaking like someone who's living under this old law. And so today we're going to talk about, well, we've been talking about, but today I want to challenge you to release that person. Yeah, I know you want to see justice, but whether you like it or not, that's the hard part. Whether you like it or not, justice was already served for that person. And you have no right to desire more justice against them because you live under a new law. So I want you to think about that person. Here in a moment, um, we're going to be singing a song to end our service. And on these tables, we got a table over here, we got a table back there, and we got a table back there. Okay, we're going to end with a song today. Because I want to end with doing something with this. We've talked about it now twice. I want to end with doing something with this. On these tables, there's just a little piece of paper with a simple prayer. Father, help me to forgive blank. And I want you to take that person that you're thinking of. I want you to write their name down. And I want you to come and lay it at the foot of the cross. I want you to take that person that you have been holding stuff against. That person that you desire to see justice against them. And I want you to write their name down. And as you bring it to the cross, I want you to look at that person in the eye of mercy. Through the eyes of mercy the way that Jesus did. Because whether you like it or not, Jesus died for that person. Whether you like it or not, Jesus loves that person. Whether you like it or not, Jesus has grace and mercy for that person, whether they deserve it or not. So today, I want you to find freedom because you let it go. Now, there's one more thing, one more person I want to talk about here. Some of you might need to write your own name down. Because some of you, yeah, you, you're not holding anything against anyone. But you beat yourself up so bad. You tear yourself apart in so many different ways. You think so little of yourself. And you don't let yourself receive the mercy from Jesus. And you just got to ask yourself, was the cross enough? Or do you feel like he should be punished and you should be punished? That's not fair. He took that for you. Why are you still punishing yourself? For some of you, maybe you need to write like 20 names. <laughs> That's okay. Forgiveness is a process, and we're going to start it today. These guys are going to sing, sing a song. When you're ready, we're going to all stand up. Let's all stand up. That'll make this easier. Don't be afraid to step on people's toes, okay? You just, we just heard a message about mercy, so they have to forgive you. So we're going to sing a song.